Look, scientific studies on health and fitness are valuable, but here's a fact. They're not everything. They don't take into account experience. They don't take into account individual variants. They don't take into account how you feel about the things that you do. Those are all equally important. When you look at scientific studies on exercise or diet or supplements, put it in the right context. This is something I would do where the test subjects like me, is this actually going to move the needle? You have to ask those questions. And oftentimes, here's what you're going to find. It's a waste of time. Science, scientific studies often are not things you need to pay attention to. So uh, paint things in context, consider the whole thing. Yeah, these uh, the science people in the fitness space annoy me with yeah. this kind of stuff. Where they debate and argue. <laughs> it's like listening to Captain Obvious tell you how to do things. Yeah, and they argue over the, like the smallest things or... They'll say something like, uh, oh, this study shows that uh, muscles loaded under stretch uh, build the most, produce the most hypertrophy. Mm. And then they'll take that and basically means this is how you should train all the time. Nothing else has value. Or they'll say something like this form of cardio uh, improved fat oxidation by 8%. And then the average person goes, but I hate that form of cardio, but it's more effective. So I guess I'm going to do it. When 8% really is splitting hairs and also you don't like it, so... It's a waste of your time. Um, and it doesn't take into account the wide variety of experience mm -hmm. um, that you get, like, let's say, as a trainer, when you work with lots of different people. A lot of people don't know this, but most studies are done on college-aged males. Yeah. They're not done on pregnant women. They're not done on people who are middle-aged. They're not done on people who have maybe dieted you know, tons of times before, who are overtrained, overstressed. Like, they're not done on lots of everyday average people. So you got to kind of take those studies – and, you know, take them with a grain of salt. There's some value in them, but they're not all the value. That's this is an, actually an interesting topic. I was thinking about this the other day. I've heard uh, strength coaches on other podcasts and um, a lot like a, a Mike Boyle, for instance, was talking about this in terms of like uh, ice and what came out with like ice studies and athletes oh, yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, you know through decades of experience has done it a certain way and like would ice them in a certain way. And it's like, you know, if one study kind of undermines what he's been doing the whole time, but he's seen success and has the best track record ever in terms of like keeping athletes healthy and, um, you know, without injury for entire seasons, like, you know, like what, what are you really getting out of like a lot of these studies? And like, I think studies are valid in terms of like being able to, see like certain instances of where where it applies like okay there's this group of people and, and we we tested for this very specific thing and um this was the outcome that's something to consider you know in terms of data points but in terms of like that versus experience i, I find that to be like far less value well totally. all the all the popular studies that are touted in the fitness space completely ignore the behavioral psychology side totally yeah. which when you've trained people like a mike boyle for decades and thousands of people of you know that you've worked with you start to realize quickly that the behavioral psychology side of fitness is far more important and so the idea that you're focusing on all these nuanced things around nutrition and program design and undulating this and like it's like Okay, like that stuff, it's good to know that, right? So I think there's value for coaches and trainers to understand that information and be well-versed in it. Like, I think that's important. But most of your time and energy should be focused on understanding behavioral psychology and then learning how to take all your studies and knowledge that you have to get the best behaviors out of your people. And just nobody talks about that. No. It's just never talked about. No, and, and you know, to touch on what you said about ICE, I know exactly what you're talking about. So uh, for years, coaches used ICE for injuries or strains on athletes. Then studies come out showing, mm -hmm. oh, ice reduces inflammation. That's true. But it also reduces the signaling that inflammation brings, which would tell the body to either build muscle or to heal Repair. in a particular way mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. And and so then people are like, oh, ice is worthless. Yeah, no, so no, 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 no. Let's take it completely out. Here, One of the number one things, and this is what coaches and trainers who are experienced understand, one of the number one, if not number one thing that you're juggling with a high level athlete is overtraining mm -hmm. and overuse. You're constantly playing the game of, can I keep this athlete from tipping over into a space where their body can't overcome the stress and damage? And what ice does, yes, it does reduce the, I don't know, muscle building signal, but it also reduces inflammation, allows the athlete to train more. And so this is how coaches have always used it. Hey, you want to be able to continue training? Let's put some ice on that so you can move. 
Now they get to practice the skill. They get to practice the plays. They get to go out and practice and uh, experience what they're supposed to experience to continue to improve their skills versus, no, 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 ice is bad. Just sit there, let it swell up. I read a study that said, you know, that it's going to help with the healing process and the muscle building process. It's like, no, 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 in, in, in application, there are time. Another one, static stretching. Mm -hmm. Static stretching, we used to always static stretch before, this is how we warmed up. Then there were studies that showed that static stretching actually weakens a muscle and could therefore increase the risk of injury. This is all true. So they threw it out the window. Right. Does this mean <laughs> that static stretching doesn't have value or I'll get even more specific. Does static stretching have no value before you exert yourself? Uh, there is some value. Yes. Let's say you have somebody with a muscle that is overpowering. Yep. That is so tight that it causes it's restricting movement. Poor, yes, poor recruitment patterns. I want to weaken that muscle temporarily to allow for better movement patterns. I used to static stretch clients all the time, but it was specific, right? It was targeted before certain exercises. Give you like a simple yeah, example. A corrective intervention. Totally. So a simple example would be uh, someone's trying to squat. It's hard for them to get position with their hands. Everything feels tight. So I static stretch their chest. Let's get that thing to weaken up in a little bit and to just chill so we can grab the bar better and get you to pull your shoulder blades back more, right? In that case, static stretching is extremely valuable. Well, the case where you eliminated that, and I remember seeing this, you still see this today in the gym, is the you know, the bro that throws three plates on the, the, the bench press and, you know, between sets, he's using the side of the thing yeah, to yeah, do yeah. a static stretch on his chest, stretching the target oh, muscle, yeah. Yeah. mainly. Yeah. So all the chicks can see how much weight he's about to bench press, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Get a good, good long stretch in between <laughs> sets, you know, yeah. and recover. But I mean, you're, you are relaxing the muscle that you are about to call upon to explode and lift, you know, 315 pounds, right. yeah. not a good strategy. Right. You want right. it at the helm and ready. Right. But, but that's, that's how nuanced it. There's an, ex you just gave a perfect example of where static stretching for the chest is very applicable. Yes. And then I just just gave you an example of where you absolutely didn't want to do it. So it's not like this static stretching is bad. It's like, well, no, based off the studies, there's application. But all that stuff, man, is so, so moot for the average client who needs to get in shape and help. And even the point you brought up with the athlete, you about the ice, what you did was uh, you, you brought up the behavioral stuff. Because like, okay, yeah, the ice is not going to help him potentially build muscle because it's going to dampen or shut down the muscle building signal by bringing down inflammation. But who gives a shit because the behaviors now that that, client, that, that athlete can do is he now can go practice again because the That's inflammation right. is down. The highest right? priority is like repeating the skill. Yes. And, and that takes precedence over him building more muscle. And so- Oh, listen, it would, what would yield a better athletic performance- um, on the field or the court or whatever to improve an athlete's overall strength by 1% more or improve their skill by 1%. Any good coach will tell you the skill and yep. the technique is going to yield better results. Same percentage increase. Okay. But it's actually more than that. We would lower the muscle building signal by a percent or two, which is what the data shows, which is again, a splitting hair. It's not a big deal. But we would improve their skill acquisition or application by more than 2%. You take an athlete who misses a week of practice and let's say uh, theoretically, miraculously, we're able to maintain their fitness, okay? Because everybody's like, well, he can't play, so therefore, or he can't practice, therefore, they're going to get out of shape. No, let's say we figured out a way to keep him in shape, but, but he still couldn't practice the skills and the techniques and plays with his team. Huge loss, huge loss. One week of that, you, you're not moving as instinctively. You're not able to produce the same results on the field. So the coach's goal is how can I get this athlete to continue to practice and train, not uh, let's maximize every little signal of building and healing um, that we can maximize. Like if you miss one practice, you know this, Justin, you coached high school students. They miss a week of practice. It's a big deal. Oh, yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. And it's so, so if you can get them to continue We're way to behind at that point, that's right. Yeah. So that's I'm, right. I'm glad you brought up the, the ice thing because I was actually thinking about this the other day about, you know, right now there's a, a bunch of uh, debating back and forth in the fitness space of like the cold plunge. Right. Same thing for the same, for the same reasons of what we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. And so based off of what the research says, like if you were somebody who is, let's say a, a, a pure bodybuilder, all I care about is building muscle. I'm not cared. I'm not cared about right. getting on the field or anything like that or an athlete. I'm not going to do a second practice. All I care about is building the most muscle. 
that and and I used to do these cold plunges after my workout because I felt amazing or whatever from doing them. But now I hear this research that says like that's going to dampen my muscle building. So then I throw that out. But what what about and and all of us have experienced this. You ever trained your legs real hard and the the rest of the day or definitely the next day you are like you barely want to move. Yeah. So you you, sit, you plop down on the couch, you stay there, you know, and long versus when you feel like you did like a mobility session, say, and you feel looser and you're less stiff and you're less likely to just sit and do nothing. Like that's the behavioral part that like that doesn't that doesn't take that in equation. So I I would ask I would prompt this question to somebody who is a bodybuilder who was using the cold plunge and they loved it and are now taking it out because they go, oh well, that's gonna dampen my muscle building signal. Yeah, but what about all your behaviors for the next 48 hours, how they've changed? And would you agree or disagree that if you're a person, after you get really sore on legs and you don't do anything about it, no mobility, no cold plunge, no nothing, and you just you just bear the soreness, how sedentary are you compared to had you done like a cold plunge? And what's that effect? And yeah. what does that affect? Yeah, my, my question- so you got to yeah. ask that. My, yeah, my questions would be this. Um, did the cold plunge allow you to work out harder? Mm -hmm. Did it allow you to work out That's it. more frequently? When you used it, did you feel better afterwards? Why are you asking that? Well, because if you feel worse, it's harder to stick to your diet. You, you, you're not going to feel as good. You're not going to stretch as much. You're not going to move as much. Um, and again, maybe you'll have more cravings. This is what tends to happen. So it's not as simple as muscle protein synthesis signal here versus here. This is 4% less. Therefore, it's not good. We're missing context. We're missing a lot of context. It's no different than what I always say as an example. When someone would come to me and say, what's the best form of cardio? I would always ask them, what's the one you like? Because that's what matters the most. What matters the most is you do it. Hmm. Not whether or not running burns 15% more calories than cycling or swimming is a little, whatever. That doesn't matter because if you don't do it, it means nothing. It's zero. And this is where people miss with the studies. And this is where the, you know, that, that side of the fitness space gets really annoying because they either argue with each other over these small little details. Like somebody's like, well, no, no, you know, creatine, you got to take it post-workout. It increases absorption by 2%. But the lady just said, look, I forget to take it all the time. Mm -hmm. Can I just take it first thing in the morning? Yeah. You know, the answer should be yes. Yeah, take it first thing in the morning. Totally fine. Yeah. Rather than some <laughs> dork getting on there and be yeah. like, no, it's, you're, you're losing 3% you know, absorption, whatever. It's like, you're missing the whole thing. And so studies uh, can be, um, and they can also, by the way, studies can also be super misleading and you also have to look at, and now I know we're going to get into this, into the weeds a little bit with this, but studies often support or point into the direction of what's considered the establishment. So what do I mean by that? Well, we're going to have a lot of studies that support the use of, let's say, enzyolytic drugs or antidepressant drugs. We have some studies that show very clearly that exercise is superior but when you get somebody who's like super study focused and on that side, someone says they're depressed, where do they tend to go? Yeah. Well, here, here's a study that shows that this antidepressant helps, you know, 15% of the people. Well, that's the tough part of the reality is uh, what's the motivation behind even conducting the study? Because yeah. for the most part, it's you, I mean, pharmaceutical companies would have the most interest in that to spend that kind of money uh, because it's going to hopefully teeter in the in the direction that uh, they can highlight certain drugs or things to solve problems you know versus like any of the like regular studies that we have of just like seeing if what you naturally can accomplish will produce this type of result there's not a lot of motivation yeah. to to spend money in that listen yeah. this is this is a fact the the theory and hypothesis I should say hypothesis that fat intake was the reason why people in Western societies were suffering from higher and higher rates of heart disease and heart attack, okay? It was supported or driven by a study known as the Seven Country Study. Uh, Dr. Ansel Keys got a grant from the government. <laughs> Isn't this the one where he took out the ones that he didn't? He took out the, the countries <laughs> oh. that didn't fit the narrative. Yeah, yeah. Then he brought the study was forward. Was the blue zone one? No, the, oh. no, he showed that fat intake, in particular saturated fat intake, but fat intake in general, was connected to heart disease, but he took out uh, the countries that were did not fit this whatsoever. That yes. had low heart rates, but consumed a lot of fat. Yeah. He brought this forward. He took those out, brought to the government. Government's like, oh, this is it. And then they funded it. And this became this totally flawed hypothesis that drove public policy, probably made, definitely made people a lot more unhealthy and sicker. So you think, how is this possible? Well, okay, science is objective, but scientists are not. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of scientists out there and maybe they're not money motivated, although a lot of them are, Maybe they're just 
fame or honor or prestige motivated. Law scientists are prestige motivated. How do I get this public, this paper published? How do I get the, you know, the, the how do I want to get my, my peers to view me as this amazing researcher and scientist? So oftentimes this is what happens with studies. And by the way, studies that show no result never get talked about. Yeah. It's the ones that yeah. always show crazy stuff. And, and right. by the way, the people over the last three years that were questioning all the stuff coming out around COVID are the people that understand this, mm -hmm. that understand totally. that. I mean, I, I saw a stat the other day that uh, for the 500 days or whatever during lockdown, we made a, we made a billionaire every day. Wow. <laughs> every day. Every day. And over $2 trillion of wealth was transferred yeah. from the poor and middle class to the, uh, the uber rich. And so it, 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 it bears you to ask the question like, yeah. okay, uh, how are they twisting these studies to line somebody else's pockets? I mean, mm -hmm. What are they leaving out that, and I mean, you just brought something up the other day, Justin, I heard you say you were reading the stat on what they were seeing as far as how many deaths oh, yeah. were actually linked to just COVID. I mean, it's like 1% 1, 1 of what's currently what the numbers trending right now less than that yeah, yeah. it's it's un and then all the stuff that came out later on from the cdc after the fact after the billions of dollars and trillions of dollars of of yeah, wealth having to sift through all that in terms of like comorbidities and and just all those factors of like the treatment that they're actually receiving in hospitals you know if you want to like really peer into all that there's a whole lot that you have to sift through to even see you know where that failure occurred to where a death happened I, and the, I, the, the point of me bringing this up okay not to you know, bring up some stuff that i know doug is Dead not going to enjoy right yeah. so but it, it's it's it you you if you're going to you know stake your claim on a study you best do all of your homework and understand who's funding it who's benefiting from it like you does have this apply to me yeah yes what does, are the potential other yes, effects that nobody's yes. looking at for example okay locking everybody down may reduce according to um you know when they do their their projections okay by the way this didn't work out but let's just say that they did work out it's projected to reduce infections by five percent that's not the full story what are the potential side effects of lockdowns are more people going to die from suicide obesity not getting cancer treated because they can't go to the doctor because everybody's locked down depression anxiety what about loss of productivity loss of innovation we have to look at the big picture yeah. to figure this out. Look, I took if I took 100 people with cancer and then I killed them all, I could put in my study zero people died of cancer because yeah. I killed them, right? Mm -hmm. That's what the study would say. According to this new treatment I did where I actually murdered people, zero died from cancer. I could literally say that at the title of the study. Yeah. So obviously that's silly and ridiculous and extreme, but that's the point that I'm trying to make. When it comes to health and fitness, it's no different. Mm -hmm. It's no different. Here's another one. I'll, I'll give you a great one. Red meat tied to all these different terrible things. You know what they don't do in studies when it comes to meat? They don't take out processed meat. Yeah, It's all meat. Salami, bologna, hot dogs, all the weird, crappy, where's that come from meat <laughs> gets thrown into. And by the way, when you eat a hot dog, you're also probably eating the bun. Chips. You're also probably eating chips. Sodas. And the rest of your diet probably looks similar right. to what you're eating. Yeah. So people who eat hot dogs every day probably eat a lot of other stuff every day. But they don't necess they don't parse They're that out. They don't tease that out at all. They don't tease yeah. that out. They just say red meat. Well, thankfully, we have other studies that do control for this kind of stuff. In fact, the World Health Organization, not necessarily the organization I always trust, which is surprising, they came out with the study said that red meat, if we cut out red meat, lots of people in lots of countries would suffer from terrible nutrient deficiencies. And I'll make this argument mm -hmm. right now. If we continue to demonize, and I'm going to stay on the subject because this leads to, uh, you know, to another topic I want to bring up. If we continue to demonize red meat, we are going to have worse health. Fact, yeah. fact. Everybody, slow down with the demonizing of red meat. It's one of the few whole natural foods that people still sometimes consume, and it's also super nutrient dense. If you want to see people get sicker. What you do is you demonize a, a, a food where they get a lot of their nutrients and where they're not eating something that's processed. Because here's what the average person will do. Oh, my God, red meat is bad. What do they replace it with? Oh, yeah. so much worse. Everything else is so much worse. So let's stop doing this and let's be smart about this. Today's program giveaway is MAPS Anabolic. Here's how you can win it. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. We're also running a sale this month. MAPS Symmetry, very popular program. 
half off. And then the RGB bundle, the most popular bundle that we offer is also half off. If you're interested in either one or both, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. This is one of my favorite attributes about the Nutritional Coaching Institute, NCI, that we work with is that they do such a good job of parsing out all the studies and then teaching coaches and trainers how to apply the science totally. to your to your clients based off of behavioral stuff. Yeah. You know, um, the information that's relevant, like, let's use that, you know. It, Speaking of, you know that they have another summit coming up. We have in, is it October, Doug? When is it? Yeah, October 17th through the 21st. Oh, cool. Do you know, did we have, we committed to going to that yet? Do you know? Does anyone know? I don't know if we're if going we, or not. We've gone to the last uh, few. Uh, where yeah, we I imagine one of us will be there. Where's it located at? Uh, good question. Um, last time it was in Phoenix, right? Yeah, they're usually in Arizona. Let so let's it. find out. But these are great, man. I mean, you, it's all coaches. Great speakers. Um, then they have where you there's you know side events where you can learn more stuff. And what's cool is because I've gone to the last is it three or four that I've gone three at least might have been three. Mm -hmm. might, yeah, I saw coaches that I at the first one that were all brand new. Yeah, and then I saw them on the third one, and they're all like super successful. Like there's this one guy that I met at the first one who he he had some huge life changes, sold his car. So that he could, oh, I remember that so that he could get coaching from NCI on how to build his business, which is scary. Right? Yeah. So I, that, was yeah. that was the first time I met him. Crazy commitment. That was the first time I met him. So I'm like, oh crap! Like I hope it works out for you. Anyway, by the third, by uh, two years later, very successful, built his business that totally, totally worked out. So it's great to see. I that. love stories yeah. like that, dude. Yeah. I mean, no choice but to to succeed in a situation. Isn't that great? Yeah. No, yeah. That, that's awesome. Speaking back, going back to Red Meat, uh, I do want to mention one of our sponsors, Butcher Box. There is a very big difference between processed meat and whole meat, huge difference. And then when you go whole meat, if you want to take it a step further, grass-fed does provide some better nutrient profiles. This is more valuable the more meat that you eat. If you're like I, like me, I eat probably a pound a day of mm -hmm. red meat. This is why I choose grass-fed because I eat so much, it makes a difference to make sure that it has uh, the best nutrient profile. Well, they've they've also helped a lot with that sort of thought that it's too expensive to get high quality yeah. meats. And, and that was always like an objection I would get, you know, as a trainer for things. And cause they, there's a lot of like specialty meat places now that like get like imported meats and all these kinds of things that are grass fed. But you know, now this is like so easy and accessible and delivers right to you. It's like, it's nice that, you know, that's their entire business model. It's like, you know, here we're going to get the highest quality and we're going to, you ship it right to your door. You know what I still haven't had that I, I ordered and I have them in my freezer. I just keep forgetting that I've got them is the egg bites. Have you tried the egg bites no. yet? Oh, you have tried them. Just yeah. Cause I, I used to order those a lot when I get my nitro and go to Starbucks and, yeah. and it's like, this is, yeah. And I, and they're very similar, but I feel like it's better quality, you know, cause it's like, it's not, oh, for sure. I, who knows, you know, wow. Starbucks really? wise, like, yeah. It's, yeah. Did you not know that? They're, they have the they're bigger. No, I knew that, but the quality. They're both. bigger and they got like more bacon kind of chunks in it. It's, it's good, dude. Wow. Yeah. Dude, I got to tell you guys something hilarious that happened yesterday. Let me, before you do that. Oh yeah. Just uh, that events in Orlando. Oh wow. Yeah. Just so people yeah, know. I thought I asked that. Oh, Orlando. That's, that's further than, than Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah. Orlando. Oh, huh, that's interesting. Did you go to the landing page on it? Does it say like, uh, does he already have who the speakers are? And he's, yeah. The so last couple of times, man, he's, uh, his, I mean. His roster. He's got is. Lane Norton, I think. Yeah, this Lane time. this time. I, the people one. he has speaking. I mean, I, I don't know what the total ticket price is on the on it. I don't know if it's up there or not, Doug. But I know like one of those speakers is like ten to $25,000 just to have him. And he has like a whole roster of people like that that are incredible. Yeah, general admission is $297. Yeah. Plus, okay. I believe there's a discount let me double check on that yeah you get 20 percent off when you use our code oh well yeah. there you Sweet. go excellent all right i gotta tell you guys what happened yesterday it was hilarious mm. so my two and a half year old is in the other in the playroom which is kind of next to the kitchen and uh we're we're doing stuff in the kitchen and jessica starts to walk over there and then we hear what we think is aurelius saying fucking what? <laughs> like he was doing something. And I then thought we you guys already it. figured this out. He says truck that yeah, way. Yeah, fire truck. No. Wasn't that the... Oh, was it? That's what I was hoping. Okay. No, no, no. We hear, he's doing something and he's struggling with something. And he goes, fucking. And so Jessica goes, what did you say? And he's like, nothing. And she's like, what did you say? What did you say? And he says, fucking. And so we're both trying not to like act shocked or whatever. Because obviously if a kid knows he gets a reaction, he's going to say it all the time. Yeah. 
So then she follows it up and she's like, where did you hear that word from? Who, who said that? And I already knew the answer, but I'm like, go ahead and let him say it. <laughs> Mama. Oh, he sold her out. He sold her out. Because <laughs> she had, hey, she talks like a sailor. Oh. Around the, yes. So, and I've always, I told her, I'm like, they're going to start copying. Well, now it's happening. Well, anyway, anytime he's struggling, that's what he says. He must have said it 10 times yesterday. His shoe gets oh, stuck, no, trying to dude. take it off. Fucking, <laughs> trying to open the door. Fucking. And each time we're trying not to laugh or react, but I think he knows now. So now we're screwed. So we just oh, went, yeah. this is funny you bring this up. <laughs> to see a two and a half year old say the F word yeah, though. Yeah, it's hilarious. We just, we're going, through the, we were, uh, we're going through this right now too. So funny you brought this up. Um, but here's what happened with us, which is, is I think it's kind of how it all unfolded. It's really hilarious. Um, he's, he's saying stupid. And uh, Katrina and I are like, oh, we don't want him to say that, right? I don't want him to say stupid, and especially if uh, context and other kids. Like, so um, her and I were like, hey, where where did you learn that? Where did you? And so both both her and I and my poor best friend's kid is a little bit older, he's like a year older, and they were playing video games one time, and I heard him say it in there, and I'm like, God, fuck, God he picked that up from Hunter, you know? what I'm saying like all irritated that he picked that up from his, and so, but then after he had said it, then and we had corrected him and said no we don't say that we don't say that uh katrina and i literally like the next 48 hours got caught saying it and him correcting us oh yeah. and then her don't and I say both, that Dad. yeah her and i have both realized like oh shit i guess we say that i guess i it don't care like like oh that's stupid like i do little things it don't even it didn't register with me it's not really like a swear word but i don't want my son saying that and now he's saying it now he's he's saying it when he's playing video games yeah. and play, doing well, stuff. Have him come hang out with the Aurelius. He'll teach you the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the real ones. Yeah. 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 Oh, stupid! Let me show you. But it's word. it's wild how watch your parents I react. Good word. I didn't. I you know I definitely don't think we say it a lot. It do, it does not take a lot. It's it's like it's almost like when it's novel mm -hmm. and they it, it registers it de, like it's like they're like well so what is that that's new I'm yeah or they'll that. just say it and not know. Until they see the reaction, mm -hmm. and then it becomes it. So then, so then yesterday, because we heard it a bunch of times, and we're like, "Oh my god!" And we're laughing also because it's also funny, but also like, "Crap, what are we gonna do?" And then Jessica said something else, and she goes, "What the f? What the f?" I'm like, "Honey, that's almost as bad." You want to hear your two and a half year old walk around saying, "What the yeah, f?" Yeah. We can't do that. That's that's one of the, that's that's the one thing that she does that that I'm like. Oh. Everything else is great, but that's the. One I thing. thought we were. I thought we were really good, but it's it because we don't swear in front of them. But this the stupid thing I didn't realize that Katrina and I like we're trying to correct that right now. I was like, oh damn, I didn't realize oh, yeah. I. Oh man, call things stupid all the time. I know. That. Yeah, yeah. I remember when I was little, when we were young, we were probably like uh, nine, and maybe ten, nine, ten. I don't know where my cousin. We're the same age. I don't know where he heard the word dildo. He heard it somewhere. <laughs> and I remember we were at his house and we were hanging out and he was just saying the word dildo and singing. And his parents were like, what are you saying? And they're like, where'd you hear that from? And he's like, yeah. uh, school, I think. But well, then after that, it was like, what is thing. nine? So I was uh, third grade. And usually I, it's like third, fourth when shit starts third, to get yeah, real. Third grade, I, I got uh, in school suspension for this. So we were, uh, it was before school started. My mom used to drop me off like a half hour, hour before school started. And I was, we were playing a uh, wiffle ball in the um, courtyard. And where we were playing was right by the principal's office. And the principal had their window open. And I was at that age where I had just learned like all the cuss words and you didn't even use them right. You're like, oh, fuck, shit, damn, fuck, yeah. shit. You know, yeah. it's just over nothing, right? right. Missed the ball. And then we, I would say like seven different cuss words. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the vice principal comes out and she comes storming over to me, grabs me by my elbow and, and pulls me into the, uh, into the office. I have like no idea what's going on and sits me down and then like literally like you stay here call my mom my mom came down the office and there was a big old deal and they were asking me the principal vice principal me my mom and Where'd you, hear you know this? and then yeah, the, oh, then no. my mom my mom was, yeah they were like saying he was saying this and he was saying that and da 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 da, da and going off of that and my mom's like just sitting there and then she looks over and she's like where did you learn all that you mom <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was just like the most awkward moment yeah. for her you know, I, oh, no. you know at, at that moment is something i remember as a kid I haven't thought about it very much until now being an adult like oh my god if that happened to me i'd be so embarrassed because it's like you can't get mad at the kid oh, at yeah. that point if their saying? kids are mirrors dude yeah totally. they're, they're total me i mean cussing to me personally it's not that big of a deal it's really how other people it's really yeah it's feel and people. react about it and you know it's like their teachers or the old lady or whoever or they're around know, other like, kids yeah, right? other 
other, other parents kids. Yeah, like you don't want to influence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember for me, it was like, uh, I got in big trouble cause I was out on the lake with my grandpa and like, I, I learned all the bad words from my grandpa. And so he was like, he caught a catfish. And he hated catfish cause they're like bottom feeders or whatever. And he, he just had this thing. I don't know if it's cause he grew up in Louisiana or whatever, but there was this whole like hatred of catfish. So he caught one and he, He's like, ah, oh, this goddamn catfish. And he's, he just hit it against the boat, <laughs> killed it, threw it back in. Wow. You know? Yeah, he was he was aggressive. And so we got back to the campsite, and I'm, like, riding bikes with my brother and everything. And then uh, my bike's handles got all loose and, and wiggly, and we were, like, out there in front of, like, my whole family. And I'm just like oh these goddamn handles and like it's just started yelling out and then you know and then like oh where did you hear this and, and my mom like went and, and took my toothbrush and got uh soap and like like started like washing my mouth out with soap and oh dude it was the methods were so bro it was so old school you guys have no idea like i had to eat like a bar of soap like because i would like what was that movie I, that's, so, the, that's the that's fucked up. That's the Christmas story. Christmas story. Yeah, yeah. That's where like, he's like, fan, his mom's making him eat soap. I'm assuming that's where like everybody got it. Well, from, I, no, no, yeah. no. Clean your mouth out. It's an old and soap tastes terrible. And it's an old. Did you guys punishment. have to do? That? I literally yeah. had to do that. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 He ate it. Yeah, uh, no, and then even like the the liquid kind. I, had to I think a, I think my parents put on my toothbrush. Didn't even give you the bar. Yeah, I think my parents did Tabasco sauce one time to us. I think we got that. I think I got for swearing. You got Tabasco sauce. Okay. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow! They threw some pain in there with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Wow, so, yeah. that's hilarious. No, I mean, uh, it's, the, yeah. the methods are crazy because what you don't want to do is is show how much power it has. That's my opinion. Like how much power oh, yeah. this word has. Totally. Because here's what happened to you as a kid: you never said it in front of your parents, but you said it way more, way more. when they weren't around. Yeah, I think that's the the move is to address it, but not make it like that's how we did the thing. Well, we don't say that. Well, it's, it's not a nice. We told them it was in a nice. And I so saw now hypocrisy in it immediately. Oh, oh right. You know, it's like people that like like screen how they they talk to you, and then you see them outside of that. I'm like, this is such bullshit. 1873 school mistress in uh, Mahaska, Iowa, was noted to have punished a boy in her class for indulging in chewing tobacco by washing his mouth out with soap. Boy, kids were wow. tough back then. Uh -huh. Little kid chewing tobacco. <laughs> He's, <still chewing. laughs> He's got a chaw. I'd be impressed <laughs> with a third grader. Oh. Give me your Barbie. Yeah, no, I was in, I was in high school the first time I tried I tried chew and I threw up. Everybody uh, did every yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know when I tried it? it fifteen times and threw up every yeah. time. Every time. Yeah. So this is how I tried it. I had just turned eighteen. And when you're 18, there's a few things you could do that are different. You went, you went and bought a Playboy, grabbed some tobacco. That's it. That's <laughs> it, right? So I went and I went to the gas station. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to try. Pretty much. I'm going to try you know, chewing tobacco. And I put I put it in my lip because that's what you know I saw people do. And I was just driving my car. And I'm just sitting there chewing on it. You know, and I'm supposed to spit it out. So I spit in the cup. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh. Yeah. What's wrong? Yeah, you're not supposed good. to swallow it. Oh, it like, oh bro. Most, it was the oops. most disgusting. It prevented me from ever wanting to try it again until yeah. much, much later. Yeah, yeah. I literally had to pull over and barf yeah. out the window. It's like I turned like white as a ghost, even more so. Like, yeah. you guys so if your kid is imagine. trying chewing tobacco, let him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll figure let it out. Let him work it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They'll figure it out real quick on uh, uh, yeah, what the issue is. I'm surprised you guys didn't make fun of me earlier. I had that earpiece in the whole, uh, time? The whole time. And then I was like, oh, no. Like, oh, I didn't even notice. Like I was getting, you know, I could have been getting but weird. Like, we were doing oh, oh, like feedback, right like, like, like Mitch McConnell or something, <laughs> you know. Like, hey, yeah. someone's telling you what to say. Uh, I froze. Justin, that's great feedback. That's great info. Bro, he froze Where'd again. Where'd you get that? Yeah, you know, he Mitch froze again. Can you believe that? What? What? I mean, poor guy. What, what's happening with him? You know you what think? sucks? He about had a stroke, this? right? Isn't that what happened? That, I don't know. Is that what it is? Maybe we could find out. But he did it again. Well, he originally had a stroke, and then I, I is mean, that what they said? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Maybe I'm you wrong. know what sucks, dude? Is literally this is how <sighs> shitty the internet is. Old guy, right? He's standing up there talking. He freezes, which is scary to see if it's somebody you care about or whatever. But obviously, nobody cares about him except for <laughs> whoever. The next day, so many memes. Oh yeah, dude. With, so many memes were coming yeah. out. Like when my wife asks me, you know, what's on the grocery list and it's a picture of him or whatever, like memes yeah. that yes. are making fun of him freezing. Yeah. Terrible. Terrible. Yeah. Well, we should find out what happened to him. Dude, and like how old are these people? It's like everybody that's running our country is like 90 years old. Oh, it's like, man. man. Lizards don't die. What? <laughs> Seriously. What is, you know, that's a first, we're, we're at a time, you know, this is the first time in history where uh, the uh, life expectancy has gone down. 
our whole entire like evolution of being around, we have continually increased that, increased that. This is the first time that we're ever on the opposite direction. Mm. Did you know that? What was that again? Opposite. That our right? average, our our average life life expectancy. Oh, life wow. expectancy so we're living is, longer, but we're it's not always gone. Kids, no, we're right? not living longer. Oh, we're for not the first time ever. This to go back. This, 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 oh, I see. What for the first time, yeah, forever. It's always been on a slow. So here's climb. what happened. Here's what happened with life expectancy uh, in the 20th century and then now 21st century. At first, uh, nutrient deficiencies were yep. a big problem. Yep. So lots of people died because of malnutrition. But then we solved that and we saw not just life expectancy explode, but we saw um, height explode. The average person became so yeah. much taller mm -hmm. because nutrient deficiencies were filled. Then life-saving medical procedures got created, and that extended, extended life. Extended life, yeah. But then what happened was uh, the you know Western medicine really just figured out how to keep people alive longer, but not necessarily alive better. Yeah. The, the so it's not that our health got better; it's that we got fi we figured out ways to patch the holes in the ship, and now that that's that time has come, we can't keep doing that uh, anymore. Now we have to actually become healthier, yeah. Not just Oh, you this this stroke happened. We'll save your life. Oh, you've got some heart issues. We'll save that. Like yeah. now, it's like how do you? So it's funny you bring that up. I just read a study. Yeah, the side effects of the interventions are Bro, a lot of times a lot worse. Look at this study that I just found that I read, which is just so telling. Okay, so this was a study on people who are hospitalized with bipolar depre depression. So consider the state someone has to be in to be hospitalized with depression. It's really bad. Like yeah. you're dark, not good. Put in an institution or, or hospital. People who are, who they did this with a study. They took some of these people who are hospitalized with bipolar depression and all they did was put them next to a window that was facing east. In other words, the sun rises, they get some sunlight. Okay, that's all. It's the only difference they had. They stayed in the hospital four days less mm -hmm. on average. Four, over half a week less in the hospital only because they got to see some sunlight when the sun rose. Just from that simple intervention. Imagine hmm. if it was a drug. Imagine yeah. if a drug showed that we could keep people out of hospital for four days less who are who are so depressed in a hospital. Imagine the publicity that would get. Oh, yeah. You know what's interesting about that too? Yeah, Courtney always used to tell me about that, like how like much more effective it was when she was allowed to take her patients out into this um, outside area and get sun and, yeah. and get fresh air versus, you know, the, the kids that weren't allowed to ever go outside their room, like how much quicker they would heal. It was, uh, it was substantial. You know, what touches on all this right now. Did you guys see the new series on Netflix that just dropped for the blue zones? Oh no, I didn't. No. It's really good. I've only watched the first episode and a half, I think is what we, we got to last night. It's literally the stuff that we've been talking about on the show forever. And they do a really good job of like going, he, like, and I'm only on the second blue zone that he's going to, but he, he's basically, you he went to all these blue zone, travel all these blue zones and is putting together all the things. And it's, it's done well because we are aware of what we thought they all were before. And what he's attributing it to is a lot of the things that we're talking about right now is just like, uh, re relationships with people, yes. the sun, yes. getting outdoor and community. Like it's just huge crazy and it and none of it's like this oh training hard or it's like the, well, it's, dude, think about yeah. how how expensive would it be not at all right how expensive would it be to take people who are hospitalized for depression put them and make sure that they're facing that they get some sunlight when the sun comes up yeah right cost nothing but again pharma doesn't make any money hospital hospitals lose money yeah. hospitals lose money, money from being because they get out yeah. earlier so all of the incentives are to for this simple intervention it's the structure of it it's so crazy Because they're me. private businesses, you know, at the end of the day. It's so crazy. Here's that's, another one. That's the, the hard part. Here's another one that I was reading, and it really dawned on me how crazy this is. You know, antidepressants are strongly correlated with weight gain. Everybody knows this. Like, you, you know, one of the side effects of an antidepressant is you can gain a lot of weight, can affect your appetite, make you eat a lot more. And people know this. This is one of the things that they'll tell you if they put you on an antidepressant. Do you know what's strongly correlated with depression? Weight gain. Yeah. So you go in. You go on an antidepressant, you gain weight, weight gain itself, the behaviors that cause weight gain, and even the weight itself cause depression. This kind of seems like uh, we need to talk about this a little bit more. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. yeah. It's like, here's the thing that can help you, but it causes something that actually makes how you feel worse. But let's not discuss this. Let's just uh, let's just keep move, moving forward. Maybe add something else to the mix. Yeah. 
another pill or whatever. Yeah. This was kind of a funny thought, I guess. I don't know if I should share. Well, I, I'll share. Um, so we were talking about like um, Jolene Brighton and we were talking about the whole like getting off the pill thing. And Courtney's been on the pill for a long time, uh, years, and it's like hasn't had, you know, natural period and all this. And like, so the highs and the, the lows are very like kind of, you know, neutral in terms of like feeling. And, and mm. I was thinking, I'm like, like literally it's, it's like an antidepressant for your vagina. What? Like, <laughs> right. Like that's, that's a totally different way to look at it. What? <laughs> if, you, if you think about it. <laughs> my, my vagina. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It just keeps kind of like, you know, I'm like, yeah. Cause we, anyway, we're trying to think of like ways of getting off of it and like going through that process. I just thought it was a funny How long thought. she been off? Oh my God. Like I want to say, uh, probably at least 15 years or oh, so. Yeah. yeah. So it's, been you know, we're time. using right now until I go get a vasectomy, which I'm still dragging my heels, well, but yeah, we're, let me know. Cause I, I need to sign Well, we're using, we're doing, so I contacted, um, father Steve and I said, Hey, what are the non medical, what are the best like birth controls that you guys advocate for? He's like abstinence. Huh? He's like abstinence. No, that's obvious. <laughs> That's, that's obvious. That is what a priest yeah. is right, I mean, you call a yeah, priest yeah. about yeah. like, hey, try not to get a woman pregnant. What yeah. should I do? Uh, all, not have sex? Have you heard of hand jobs? <laughs> yeah. No, that's not what happened. He's uh, Join the monk life. No, no, no. You you, you, you test ovula for ovulation. Yeah, just, like, ovulation you, just like you would if you're trying to get pregnant. That's it. There's really only, I mean, there's that. You pee on ovulation thing. It tells you if you're ovulating. And if you are, then you don't, you don't have intercourse that way. And that's that. Yeah. And that's, it's very, it's actually very effective as so long as you do mm. it. You know? Yeah, I think that's a. I I mean, coming from only the, thing that sucks is when a woman's ovulating. That's when she wants to have sex the most. It's like, damn it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. <laughs> what are yeah, we gonna do? Yeah, Missed yeah, opportunity. Do you guys? You guys don't do that, do you? No. Yeah. No, we're. I mean, we're uh, still could get pregnant. I oh, mean, that's yeah. how. That's the camp we're in right now. I was like, uh, I mean, at one point, right? Katrina's gonna get to, and she's she's getting closer to that age where she's like, okay, I don't want to have another kid this late. I'm I I used to be more staunch about it because I want I didn't want the age gap to be so big with Max. I'm at a place now where I love him so much that I would love to have a second kid. So I don't I care less now. Yeah. The, the things that I cared about before, I was like, oh, I want well, one or two, and if I have two, I want it to be like this. Now, like the experience of having Max now was was so incredible that I just want to. I would I would mm -hmm. I'd, I'll take it a second time no matter what, and I'll figure out those challenges mm -hmm. that I thought I would have. So we're we're trying but not trying or not. You're, you're you're not not trying. Yeah, yeah. Like we're yeah. not ch checking ovulation and we're not trying to time stuff or anything like that. But then we're just like, if it happens, it happens. Yeah. And then at one point, I'm sure she's going to say to me like, "Hey, I definitely don't want to risk getting pregnant." Well, the, the our age. last one gave us made me gun shy because up until then, my you know pull out method was like 100 <laughs> percent, like never. Like was a hundred percent. You're you're too braggadocious about it. Then this happened. this yeah. last one was a you know, wonderful surprise. Obviously, it's a, I love my little baby. But now that makes us like timid. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. don't get near me. Maybe this isn't as effective as I thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe I didn't. I don't know. I didn't realize that. I didn't. I, of course, I should have assumed that Courtney was. I didn't even know that that she's been on for that long. Yeah, yeah. It's been a long time. It's really it's really tough for someone who's been on for that long. I mean, it changes your hormone profile, right? So mm -hmm. that, that's a, a massive. Did you guys meet? Was she on it when you met? Uh, no, <gasps> bro. You know what might happen? She might like you more, way more. <laughs> I was like, yeah. No, I'm serious. I'm yeah, like, you, I, yeah. It's not like I'm a, like a, a femi dude or something. That's but, what I'm saying. Worried about it? No, no, yeah. no, no. That's not what I mean. No. When a woman goes on birth control, she tends to be m more attracted to men who have less obvious displays or signs of testosterone. When they're off birth control, and especially when they're ovulating, they tend to be more attracted to guys like you. Wow. Who is just oozing. He's just a big ooze. He's just so much <laughs> of man. manliness coming over there. This Yikes. is true, by the way. Oh, dude. I, I, I was a changed subject here. Okay? <laughs> You're welcome, no, Let's Doug. drink it in. Um, yeah, just, just like, I was actually thinking about, um, and you know, and maybe this is a deeper topic we get into another time, but I just, it was an, it's an interesting thought that I had about, uh, nutrition and changing diet. And, you know, what prompted it was I was, you know, why this has happened a couple weeks ago, like pay attention. And I know I tease you about how much you eat right now, but mm. I also know what it's like to be there 
where your like metabolism is roaring so much, you have so much lean mass, you're training so hard and so consistently that you you're probably eating four thousand to five thousand calories a day yeah. and not gaining any body fat. And w obviously, I am not training that way, and I have, I have probably thirty pounds uh, less muscle than I had during my peak competing time or whatever. And what I didn't realize till after the fact, and it's kind of like a duh, but it's still hard to to pay attention to or really change because it's subconscious, is your eating behaviors and patterns that you built around having that physique. So there's a way you eat right now that supports and is ideal for the physique that you've built. But if your life changes and you decide, you know what, like I'm going to be less of this buff dude, I'm going to be more mobile, I'm going to train less and whatever, or something were to happen, you know, you not only needs to follow. Yeah. And it, and th it's tough because you have made these associations with, you know, certain places that you eat at or certain meals that you have of portion sizes. And it's like, you know, I catch myself doing things a lot where it's like, Hey, that was the the portion size that I ate when I was two thirty six percent body fat and jacked and training seven days a week. Oh, you, like, got, you remember how hard it was training ex athletes? Yeah, yep. ex athletes like college athletes, and all of a sudden, and they're like, I remember I had one. She was oh, uh, a rower. The calorie amounts. Insane she was a rower, and rowers yeah. train a lot, a lot, a lot at high level in college. And I remember. Her, I'm like, what do you have for lunch? She's like, well, I have some chicken and I have some rice. And I'm like, well, that's, you know, okay, that's pretty good. And I'd say, can you show me? And she was eating like 10 ounce chicken, chicken or 12. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, it's that's the whole rotisserie. I'm yeah. like, that's a lot. And she's like, it is. And I'm like, how did you eat? She's like, well, I ate kind of like this, I guess, when I was training. I'm like, yeah, this is a lot. I said, your portions have to change. But what happens is you're so, you get, you develop, this is where the whole set point, people are like, oh, you have a weight set point. No, you have a behavior set point mm -hmm. that you develop. You have to change your behaviors yes, yeah. to match your lifestyle. So I know exactly. And what you're you justify about. it because totally. it's healthy. Yeah. You know, I'm, oh, I'm eating my veal and, you know, gluten-free pasta or I'm having my, my yeah. rice and bison. I and always so, double up on protein. Yeah. You know, it's like just something you do. And so it's hard to kick that habit. Man. Oh, you know what triggered this was, you know, when we were getting those meals from, uh, whatchamacallit, and I was like, look, I was like the portions. I'm like. That's small. Yeah. I'm like, God, this is a tiny ass. I eat like three, four of these normally. I'm like, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm eating a lot more than what I thought I was eating. When you start to have somebody, at, somebody else control it for you and it's tracked and you're going like oh wow you know and it's like and of course all that stuff is like D of course i should know that I know. you know but it's it's so ingrained uh on some of these behaviors that you forget like oh wow like i really have to modify and adjust all those things because my life is changing i'm at a different season in my life and if i don't do that i mean i actually attribute this to why i think 90% of all athletes that I've ever trained that are, you know, older, 40, yeah, post, 50, right? are mm -hmm. all really overweight. All of yeah. them. Yeah. Because of this, because they still eat the way they ate, or even like if it's not exactly the same, it's still so much higher than what they yeah. should be at. And all they're for, really looking at is their lack of activity yeah. as like the biggest factor. And so they're always trying to like... Cause that, that was the method, you know, and I, I, I got caught into this whole thing. It was like, I could just eat whatever and didn't really have to pay attention. Cause I was moving so much. So intense. You had to eat that much. Yeah. It was just, it was fueling me. That's the thing is like you learn, here's what happens to a lot of athletes is you learn to eat more, which is actually hard at first. Yeah. When you train a young athlete, oh, yeah, that's true. one of the things you have to convince a young athlete to do is just like stuff themselves. Then they get into this habit of doing it and they do it for years. This is how they eat now. And then all of a sudden. They stop that activity. Yeah. Oh, I got to relearn, you know, what's going on. That's you know, the part, that's the part why I think I was so challenged was because it was such a challenge to get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was such it a took challenge. took years to be able to eat that. Oh much. yeah. It took me a long time to actually be consistent with eating like that. And it's like, so there's even there. So there's another layer there of, yeah, I know I'm supposed to eat less, but then I'm like, I don't want to go. I don't want to eat so much less than what if I wanted to go build a bunch more muscle yeah. again and be that big guy for a while? Like maybe I changed my mind. I'll go the other way. Am I going to go through that whole process again of like struggling to eat that much? It's a weird, it's a, a really weird predicament to be in and to be aware of and to pay attention to. And I just think that that happens to so many people where they have career changes or just goal changes or, or life stress like, hormones yeah you know, just i know it's a, it's a, and this is crazy because then you have people who say you can't really speed up or slow down your metabolism that much okay buddy all right all right yeah i've seen crazy <laughs> changes in people's metabolism well mine is radically different 
And I still weight train. I'm still yeah. considered yeah. an athletic or fit type of. You still person. have a fast metabolism compared yeah. to somebody your height and weight. But that's just but that's, not like it was. That's how crazy yeah. it can yeah. be. I mean, it could be that different. I'm talking about thousands of calories difference of what I can consume today compared to what I could consume then, and it's insane. Yeah, very, very crazy. crazy. All right, so I wanted to to talk to you guys, and we're going to make sure we get them on the phone. But I wanted to talk to you, you know, the audience about. So they don't know. Some people know that we have an arm of our company that invests in companies, right? We invest mm -hmm. as like angel investors in essence in certain companies. And my cousin, um, Alex, he very successful here in Silicon Valley. He helped start one, uh, a, a very successful company. Then he went off and started his own company. And when he talked to me about this, or he talked to me and my other cousins about this, it, I didn't really understand it at first, but then I asked him to explain it. And it's so crazy and disruptive that, uh, I mean, I'm confident. I've already told everybody in the family, like Alex is going to build, a, this is a billion dollar company for sure. So essentially what it is, and we'll talk to him on the phone, but he was able to figure out a way to let people create a trust online for free, for free, wow. which right now, if you want to do that, you either go to a lawyer and spend thousands, thousands of dollars yeah. or at the cheapest, you get the paperwork online, which costs you hundreds of dollars, but then you still need a lawyer to kind of implement it, whatever. This is all on an app, allows you to put your assets under the whole deal and to set it up is is totally free and um, it's pretty remarkable. And so- I'm super yeah. excited to talk cool. to him. Yeah, yeah. I, have, I have questions for him, so I'm, I'm excited to talk to yeah. him. Yeah, so for people who don't understand, like you, you, just real quick, because I know we'll get in the weeds when we talk to him because uh, this is his space and we're all very interested. If you have any assets at all, anything at all, a car, shoes, a house, whatever- and a family, and you die, that goes to probate, which is the state. The state then has to hear everybody's claims to your stuff or whatever. And on average, it takes 18 months. In other words, your stuff doesn't go off to your kids and other people uh, for like a year and a half, mm -hmm. unless you have a specific trust. But again, that's like thousands of dollars. That's also or, assuming yeah. it goes well and there's not infighting or issues that's right. either because then, right. then it can get really bad. Yeah. So if you're it. a new parent, you need to, you should do a trust ASAP and do it as soon as possible because then it's easier to add assets to the trust than it is to go backwards to the whole thing. But again, it used to be this really expensive, stupid process, take time order. Now you go, he they literally have this company. It's, it's, it's going now. We invested in it because we, we saw what they could do free. You go there for free. Set up a trust, boom, costs you nothing. The company's called Get Dynasty. So it's Get, Di excuse me, the company's named Dynasty. The website is getdynasty.com, but let's get them on the phone and, and talk to them. Cool. Alessandra, where are you, dude? Are you in the, looks like you're in the bathroom or something. What's going on? I'm in a WeWork phone booth. Uh, they have these phone booths. We, we, you know, we're an early stage company. We don't spend a lot of money on offices. So yeah. we get the shared workspace in the WeWork and then. We go into the into the phone booths when we need to take meetings. So, Alex, you started this company, um, and I want to get to it. Uh, but before I do, one of the main things you guys do, and 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 we'll get to why we invested because it's actually it's pretty crazy what you what you guys are doing over there. But uh, let's talk about one of the main things you guys do, which is you create trust or you help people create trust. So, first, why is a trust important? Why do you need one? And then, what is the process? normally look like to create a trust? What a trust actually does is it protects you. And so it's a personal entity that you create and just like a corporation or LLC, you put everything that you own personally into the trust. Uh, so instead of owning your house and your cars and your bank accounts and your stock brokerage accounts, uh, everything goes into the trust, the trust owns them and you control the trust. Uh, the reason why people create trust, there's many reasons. There's different types of trust. Um, and tr the overall reason to create a trust is for protection. So a trust can protect you from probate court. A trust can protect you from lawsuits. A trust can protect you from uh, creditors or bankruptcy. If you go bankruptcy and you have your assets in a, in a protection trust, um, those assets are separate from you. It's like you may lose everything that's under your name personally, but like the trust protects the assets that are in the trust. Yeah. Now for the average person who doesn't have tons of property, huge brokerage accounts, one of the main values, and I'd love your, if, either correct me if I'm wrong or, or let me know if I'm right. One of the main values of a trust is if, if you die, 
A lot of people don't know this. Your stuff goes to probate court, and before your State kids can get, you know, some of your money or the house or whatever you left to them or your whatever, it has to go to probate court, and that can take like six months before it gets released. Is that accurate? Yeah. So uh, probate court. Um, is a public process where if anything happens to you um, and you don't have a trust, uh, you're and you, there's thresholds. There's there's like uh, probate thresholds for every single state. They're very low. Some states are like thirty thousand dollars. Some states are fifty thousand dollars. Some states are a hundred thousand dollars. No more than I think California is the most. It's like hundred and forty thousand or something like that. Um, and so if you exceed in that, you know, you have property, you have some cash in the bank. If you exceed the, the probate threshold and you die or you become incapacitated or you become mentally unstable, um, your assets are going to be processed through the probate court system. The probate court system takes on average 18 months. Um, and usually the individuals that are fighting for the assets, like, you, you know, your family members, um, usually if there's a lot of family members, especially if there's people that are like fighting for them, they're going to get legal representation. They're going to get lawyers um, and a judge in the end of the day is going to decide, you know, what happens to your estate. Uh, probate court is a massive tax on the poor base, not, not, the, not just the poor, the poor and the average American. So, like everybody that doesn't have a trust, like has to deal with probate court and, and probate court ends up absorbing hundreds of billions of dollars every single year. And again, it's not coming from the rich. They already, they have trust and trust completely circumvent probate court. Everybody else, like if you just have a simple will, that will has to be processed through probate court. Um, and so it's a lot of time and it's a lot of money. And it's a lot of family drama. Cause again, it's a public process. Anybody can turn up like the homeless guy down the street can literally turn up and make a claim for my assets because he can say that, you know, I promised him something and whatever. And like, they have to deal with that in the, in the court, in the public court process. Okay. Now uh, here's the other thing that now this is where I understand all this. And now this is where things get really wild and disruptive. And what I mean by that is you, you've you actually created a company and I've told these guys off air, I believe the potential for this company is to be a billion dollar uh, company. It's so disruptive to the space because the regulations and laws around creating trust are so archaic and so solidified that in order to create a trust, it costs like thousands of dollars. So the average person is like, okay, I want to go create a trust. You go to go get a lawyer it's going to cost you thousands of dollars and they got to manage it. And there's really no other way to do it until your company came out dynasty and you figured out a way to legally do it for what? So normally what does it normally cost and how, how, how does it work through dynasty? Yeah. So today, uh, you know, before dynasty, there's two ways to create trust. You can go see a lawyer, you can pay anywhere from $1,000, to $25,000 just to create the trust. Um, and again, it depends on the complexity of the trust. The other, the other way you can create trust is you can go to what we call online stationary stores. Um, and those are like LegalZoom. Um, there's a few other companies that are similar to Rocket Lawyers, a few other companies that are similar to these companies. And they charge you a few hundred bucks, you know, anywhere from like 300 bucks to like 600 bucks to create a trust. But literally, they're selling you a stack of paper. Um, and they're not helping you actually move assets into the trust. They're not helping you administer the trust. They're literally just helping you with the, tr the creation process. At least if you go to a lawyer, you pay a little bit more, but they're, they're full service. They're going to help you with every single part of, you know, trust creation, trust administration, trust funding, any questions you have to so get a little bit more on the lawyer side. Um, these online stationery stores, you know, they, we, we looked at them. And so when, in the very beginning, the, the reason why we came up with this idea is because you know, we all were, me and my two co-founders, we were the first employees at a very successful tech company called Carta. I was the first sales rep. My, my um, co-founder was the first employee. He's an engineer. My other co-founder was the first product manager. Um, and so, like, as Carta became more successful, our stock started becoming worth more money. So, we got access to the best financial advisors and lawyers that exist. Um, and so, we started looking into the process to create a trust. And, you know, when you, and so, uh, and and you know, Sal, one of our cousins, he, he's a trust attorney. So I reached out to him right away. And I said, Hey, I want to create a trust. Um, you know, how do I do it? And he sent me a fill in the blank uh, form. Like literally it was, it's like a template. Like he has a standard template. You fill in the blank and boom, it's 1500 bucks. Um, and so the second we saw that, we're like, no, this, this should, this shouldn't cost anything. Like we can automate this template, this fill in the blank template, like 100% with software and it costs us nothing to deliver. 
Um, and so that's why we, you know, our simple trust product that helps protect you from probate, it's better than a will, is 100% free. So where, how is it different than LegalZoom then? I mean, you told, I mean, you gave the example of it's like a stack of paper, but how is a, a template that someone just pays for, how is that different? Like, what are you getting more by going through Dynasty versus just going through LegalZoom? Yeah. So I would say the biggest difference overall, number one, is we are the only free living trust software product that exists. Oh, free. So free. For free, oh. free first. First of all, we'll focus in on free. Okay. Nobody else, like everybody else, they're all on the online stationary standpoint. They're all doing, um, you know, just a simple trust, the, pro, the probate protection trust. Um, and they're charging hundreds of dollars for one-time trust creation uh, versus us. It's 100% free. Um, and then in addition to that, we have this entire platform that lets you go in anytime you need to make a change. You can literally do it from your cell phone. We've plugged in. It's it's not uh, included in the free option, but we've um, we've plugged in remote notary because usually you want to get your trust notarized depending on your, what state you're in and it makes it more defensible if it's notarized. So because laws changed during the COVID pandemic that allow you to go online and do a remote notary session, that's what helps make this possible also. Um, and so these other services, they don't offer remote notary, right? They, they charge you hundreds of dollars for trust creation. We make trust creation free. And then we charge you for, if you want to do remote notary, if you want any advanced distribution options, if you want to actually get the assets out of your name and do more like asset protection stuff like we talked about. Those are the advanced ser- uh, the advanced services that we offer. That's how we make our money. Okay. So it's just the biggest difference is how we make our money. R- what they're doing, we give away for free. And then we're making money with all the additional services. Yeah, uh, got it. Yeah. So got it's it. really, really like for the average person who's just like, "Hey, I got a family, starting my family. I just need to trust. You go there and do it for free. Nobody else can offer that. Nobody and, does." And that. then is your so all the other let's say bolt-ons that you do after that, for like moving assets and the other the ways that you guys make money, are you competitive with uh, the lawyer or competitive? Cheaper. Or you're cheaper. Way yeah. less. Wow. Just, just like every other venture backed Silicon Valley, te- you know, technology company, like we're, you know, we're, we're going to be the most aggressive. We're going to, we're using the most software, which allows us to bring costs down for everybody. So give me an example of, cause I, you know, obviously I forget what the number is of the average American that lives paycheck to paycheck. They don't, they may, maybe they have a house, maybe they have a car, maybe they have a, a, a watch passed down from their grandfather. Like at what point? Do you say like you have enough assets to this makes sense to do this? Like, is it literally just as soon as you have a single asset that is worth more than 20 or 30 grand, you may as well do this? Or it's like, well, until you get to about a quarter million or more dollars worth of assets, then so what, what would you say is like, wh- what's the bare minimum you should have of assets but to do this? Well, the reason we built this company so you can anybody can set up a free trust in less than five minutes from their mobile phone. We literally have people that we because they do selfie checks at the end that literally set this up. They shouldn't do it, but they set it up while they're driving their cars. (laughs) You know, the the (laughs) guy set it up while he was underneath his car, like doing some mechanics work, and like literally said it looked like he was in a mechanics garage. Um, And so, like, we built this product for everyone. And so, you asked me that question: When's the best time to do it? The second you open your first bank account. Because yeah. that should immediately go. It doesn't matter if you only have a hundred bucks. Like eventually you save money, you have more money. But like you, now it's already in your trust. The problem with waiting is like, you're like, well, I don't have enough money. Like, why would I do that? And so you open your first bank account, you, then you buy some stock, then you get a car. Pretty soon you have all these things um, that aren't in the trust. So then you create a trust. And then the so now you have spent. to go back and you have to retitle all these assets. And there's nothing more... Uh, of a pain in the ass and having to retitle assets, especially real estate. You have to deal oh, with county. Okay. You want trust when you buy the real estate because they ask you, how do you want a title? I want a title in my trust. Boom, oh, it's done. You okay. Well, that's a huge, that's a huge selling point to me. So in other words, you, I also save money by getting it before I think I even need it because going forward, as I start to acquire these assets, I buy that fifty thousand dollar classic car, I buy that new house. Now I don't have I don't have to go pay a lawyer later on after I recreate. I've already got a trust, so it's like when I buy it, I put it in that name. So I probably save money okay. that way too, right? Money and uh, lots of time. Yeah, lots that of time. That That's why right. the best time to do it is as early as possible in your adult life. We want to change the behavior. Like the second you turn 18 and you open your first bank account, you should have your trust and everything that you buy should go in that trust. Oh, wow. Yeah. What's interesting That's to really- me about this whole process and as Alex was explaining to me a while ago 
is just how many uh, old archaic laws and regulations that exist. Literally, it would seem to protect uh, and service the wealthy and make these protections unattainable for anybody else. Like the average person to spend $3,000 to create a trust, they're not going to do that. Uh, but a wealthy person is no big deal. They'll spend $100,000 organizing all this stuff. It's the same thing with tax law. It's the same thing with all these other things. It's like there are things out there that you can do to protect yourself and to build wealth and all that stuff. But a lot of it's unattainable or inaccessible to the average person. And so something like this, uh, I mean, free. Is you know? there ever is there an ever a case where I'd want to reverse my trust or w w would you ever want to do that? Does it ever make sense to, or to to change? I guess the trustee like what or change is, uh, changes yeah. make sense. Like reversing it, I, there's no downside. It doesn't change the way you do your taxes, especially a simple trust. Okay. Like the more complex trust, like you, the assets are no longer taxed under your name. It's like having a separate entity. But for the simple, revocable, the ones we do for free, like it had, there's no downside at all. You may want to change it because you may get married, you may get divorced, you may every child you have, you want to change it. Every time you move from one state to the next state, you need to change, you need to update it. Um, every time you acquire a new property or a new asset, you want to go put that in the trust. So there's reason why, that's why it should be software. That's our big vision is like, the fact that all these other companies are just a stack of paper, like how do you, now you have to like go back to a lawyer to modify that. Like every time you need to make change, so you go back to the lawyer. Wow. Like with us, you just log in from your phone and find like time is another big important factor here. Some, a lot of people have money as well to go pay a lawyer, but they don't want to do it because of the time that it takes. They don't want to like go through the friction of setting up the time and thinking about it. And so like being able to do it in less than five minutes, that's a huge selling point for our software. Yeah, this is massively disruptive because not only are you going to save up, up front by it being free for any, anybody just to do it, but then as you get wealthier and as you acquire more and more assets, you're just, it's getting cheaper and cheaper for you every time because you would, mm -hmm. any other person would have to go get a lawyer to move and set all that stuff yeah. up. Wow, that's that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's amazing. So, um, Al yeah, Alex Alessandro, <laughs> thanks for coming on here. We'll talk more because uh, I, you know, when I first heard this, I was like, and I told you, and I told every, I told everybody in the family, I'm like, this, this is a billion dollar idea. It's really insane. And uh, once I exposed the, the fellas to it, we all decided to invest. We so we're now investors in this those NFTs. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Whenever we have conversations like this, which is rare, but we do every now and then, I, the next question I know everyone's going to ask us, are you guys taking on any more money or no? We have existing investors that are uh, prompting right now, like trying to give us more money to go fat, to, you know, invest, put more fuel into the fire. And, you know, I don't know. It's an it's not a good time to take money right now because of market conditions. Agreed. Right, you don't you know take money when money is expensive, um, but um, you know we're, yeah. we're day to day determining whether or not we're going to take. Money. They don't need the money. Yeah, we don't a, need it. We don't need it. They don't need the money. Yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, if anybody's interested, check this company out. It's uh, getdynasty.com. dot com, um, and uh, again, it's uh, it's great. We we invested ourselves as Mind Pump, so we believe in it. Alex, great talking to you, man. And you got everybody, this is exciting. So he's a father. Great father, by the way. He's a good man. He's got another baby on the way. Uh, oh, congrats, congrats brother. Yeah. When's the due date? Uh, October 3rd. Oh, gosh. Around the corner, bro. Per perfect time. Perfect time. Start a company and do all this at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> You're on a roll, man. He's, hey, hey, a year and a half ago, he had no gray beard hair. Look at him now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it all happens. All right, Alex, I'll talk. Taking, taking after you. I'm taking after you. Yeah. Hey, listen, I'm way ahead, bro. Yeah. I got four of them. So, <laughs> all right, man. All right, brother. We'll talk to you later, bro. Right, take care. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. You got it. All right. Anyway, what you guys? What you guys think? Of, so, my, you can see the bro, uh, so oh, massively, so massively disruptive. disruptive. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. It's, I can't wait to see how this all. Unfolds. He's great too. The guy's just he's such a good guy. He's such a hard worker. I love that they made it free, man. That's yeah. that's huge for people to just yeah, yeah. protect their awesome. stuff. All right. So, what's our shout out? Shout out the documentary that I was uh, referring to. So it's on Netflix. It's called uh, "Live to 100." And I'm like I said, I'm only an episode and a half, but really good. I can just tell by the way it's shaping up. Uh, they're communicating the things about the blue zones that we've tried to talk about to our audience for a very long time on this show. And so I think you'll appreciate it. So go watch that. It's on Netflix. Joy Mode is a company that makes supplements to enhance libido and sexual performance. All the components in their products are tested and shown to be efficacious in studies. This stuff is legit. Go check them out. Go to usejoymode.com forward slash mind pump. 
Use the code MINDPUMP at checkout for 20% off your first order. All right, back to the show. First question is from Manda10. How do you find and maintain a neutral spine while doing conventional deadlifts? When, if ever, is it normal to see some lower or upper back rounding? All right, let's start with the first part. So one way I used to get my clients to figure out kind of neutral spine was I would have them go to the extremes and then that would give them a point of reference and then they'd go in the middle. So in other words, I tell my client to strongly arch their lower back and then strongly put their back in what's called posterior uh, position. So it's like strongly arch it and then tuck it and then, and then go in the middle. Yeah. There's neutral right there. So that's an easy way to kind of find where it's at. Now, the second part of the question is, do is it normal? Like cat cow or do you do it like standing up? I'll have them do it standing because then they get into the deadlift position. I Although cat cow is a great way to do it if they have trouble. Yeah. You know, getting I it. think the the PVC pipe is the best trick in the yeah. book. Right. I remember it was like, a good trainer one. Man, that was like halfway through. I mean, you could do it by yourself too, though. You can you can do that by yourself. Yeah. You by by grabbing grabbing the stick. That uh I remember the first time I saw that. Uh, it was like at least eight, nine years into my career. And I was like, why has no one shown me this before? Now, what are you looking for with that? Because someone listening. The three like, contact points, right. right? And we have a video. And by the way, I think you should put that in the in the subscription, Justin. I think that's a great like teaching mm. tool oh, yeah. for coaches and trainers. But, you know, you can use any, you can use a broomstick. You don't need a PVC pipe. But, and you want what? Back of the head? Yeah, uh, back of the head. And it goes down the, the shoulder blades and then your and then your hips. Yeah. So it'll, it'll be, and you want all three of those points of contact to sync on. And we have a video. Do we have one on Mind Pump TV? Is it Mind Pump TV or is it on the Instagram? I know we have a video of, of me teaching this or Justin teaching this. Yeah. So we have a video for this that I'll have the, the, the guy's link uh, for us. So we coach you through it, but it's really simple to teach and show. And it's, you, you, you can feel those points of contact. So, you know, the minute you come out of that position, the only bad side about it. And this is why I said it's a trainer tool is because I've seen people maintain contact and over arch their back because they can do oh, this mm -hmm. and still have their head and everything touching. No, no, you cannot. You cannot. If you, you'll, one of the three points will come off. You cannot excessively arch in the neck or the Use hips. The head though, kind of. That's why there's three points. Protrude, if yeah. you keep the three points of contact, you can. You I just you, okay. So I, I don't disagree with you. I think it's good. Uh, the the one I communicated is like you could do right now, listening to the podcast. You can even test it yourself. The only challenge with it, and this is where I see the PVC pipe being even more valuable. The challenge is some people don't even have a connection to be able to go anterior pelvic tilt, posterior pelvic tilt. Like they don't even know how to get their pelvis yes. to do this movement because they're so stuck in a particular position. That's why I love, okay, so I used to do the exact way you said. I would yeah. I would stand next to him. I would show them excessive arch. Then I would tuck it all the way in. And I'd say, then I'd find, and I'd be, have my hands on the hips and I'd be telling them to do the same thing and, say, and then find neutral. There's the neutral. But some people don't even know how to- They can't articulate. Yeah, they yeah. can't articulate their hips like that. And so this is where uh, tools- for for a for feedback is is so valuable because it's they you can put that stick yeah. there you can get you can literally physically move their head their hips they're everywhere and then like okay feel those three points of contact now bend over and pick that bar up cannot lose that and they, they literally have to go so slow at first to just to yeah. figure out to figure out how to articulate now for that another way you can do this without a stick uh, would be to lay on the floor with your knees bent and then mm -hmm. try to flatten your lower back uh, on the floor and then try to arch it and then there's your extremes. And they go somewhere in the middle. Uh, but the second part of the question I think is important to address because the spine flexing or extending or whatever, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. But when there becomes an issue is when the spine is flexing or moving in a position and it goes towards its end range of motion. And then what supports the weight is the spine itself. In other words, if the spine can move this much and this much, if it moves a little bit, it's okay because it's still muscle supporting it. It's when it gets to the end that it becomes a problem. Like my elbow, if I support a weight, but I'm holding my elbow fully extended, and then I try and lift the weight, now I run the risk of my elbow joint supporting the weight versus if I curl my arm a little bit and I still have room, then it's no longer the joint, it's the, it's the muscle. Yeah. That being said, with the deadlift, you want the lower back to stay as That's stable still, as possible. Yeah. yeah. The upper back rounding is not an issue for most people. In fact, uh, you'll see many top lifters have some kind of upper back 
Right. You well, did I think you that's did like, like that way. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, if yeah. you watch the way I'm very strict. Yeah. And then you have this kind of natural curvature in well, your upper back. Real world situations, you're going to be in a lot more rounded back situations than you are like perfect yeah, mechanics. Yeah. And so it's, it's unrealistic to not account for that. What I think is why we pull as trainers, we try to pull clients in that direction is to find neutral spine to really like work just on the bracing mechanism there to be able to stabilize and keep it, um, you know, supported. And so, to to be able to figure that out, a lot of times it's easier once you once you figure out where that neutral spine is to be able to feel that core connection, and then you're going to work off of that and and make sure you could still maintain control. If you don't have control and a bracing mechanism in place in a rounded position, like that's a problem. Yeah. This th I, this like I can't stress the the t the PVC pipe tool as a. I mean, I think that I made trainers buy it after that, or we always had it in the in the gym going forward. Because if I was teaching deadlift or squats to a client after that point of learning that 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 was with me always. Mm -hmm. The only way it's not with me is if I got an advanced client who I've already taught all those mechanics. But if I'm teaching a hinge movement, I'm using that I'm using that stick as a feedback. It's such a great great tool for them to feel that yeah. as they move through the use that use the wall use the floor you know you th like those contact points do really emphasize to the client like I, they can like feel that uh that that point of contact so it's, it's what, just it's helpful in what that tripped regard. me out i remember early on as a trainer was um how few people could bend over without completely flexing the spine like so few people can actually bend forward at the hips and it's always coming from the lumbar spine. And so I would get people to bend over and they were automatically in this really rounded low back position and getting them to bend over without doing that. It was like a new skill that their brain didn't compute. And right. I remember being shocked, like, no, 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 just do it this way. No, 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 just do it this way. And they couldn't yeah. because there was no connection there. If you don't have that connection, you probably shouldn't deadlift yet. But when you can get the neck connection, then you go and you deadlift very lightly until you can strengthen that better position. And then over time, you can add weight to the bar. Old. And then in that case, deadlifts are very safe. You know how hard it is, too, if somebody new to teach them hip hinging versus squatting. Yes. That's right. Just that in general is going to take you a while to establish. So, Next question is from Bev Giberson. My right arm is weaker than my left, and it affects my barbell curls in that my left doesn't feel fatigued at eight reps while my right is struggling for form. Should I stay at a lower weight until my right arm catches up or switch to dumbbells? Th this is actually an easy fix. Mm -hmm. and, okay. And I'll tell you why I'll, I'll tell you how to do it, but then I'll tell you where people mess up. Definitely go to dumbbells, definitely train one arm at a time and let the weaker arm dictate the reps and the weight. That's mm -hmm. where everybody screws up. So most people logically can say to themselves like, okay, there's a balance, there's an imbalance mm -hmm. between my right and left. By the way, if you're feeling the imbalance, on a barbell that much is a big imbalance. Usually people don't even notice how much of an imbalance they have until you kind of show them. But if you're already feeling it on a barbell, then this is a pretty big imbalance. But you'll you'll fix it pretty quickly if you do what I'm saying. But where people mess up is they do the one arm at a time training and they tend to let the strong arm dictate the weight and the reps. So what they do is they do good form for 10 reps with the right and then they go to the left that's weaker and then they cheat or do shitty form to match the strong arm. Wrong. Right. Use the weak side as the gauge. Th that's the gauge. Mm -hmm. How many reps can I do? And what does my form look like? And then it's going to feel easy on the stronger side. That's okay. Your whole goal is to catch up. Your goal is not to build strength equally in both sides and have them maintain this disparity. So literally your stronger side is going to get an easy workout while the, the weaker side is going to get the workout. And if you do that, you catch up pretty quickly within a few months you'll see yourself balancing out because your body actually wants to be balanced. If you give it that stimulus, it'll balance itself. It'll, out. Ca it'll catch up. The, the one thing I would add to that, because uh, the other mistake that I see is people take that advice. And then, so let's say it's my right arm. That's really weak. And so I'm going to do the curls with my right arm first. And they hear you, you know, do as many as you can with that one. And then mirror the other one. And as many as you can turns into two shitty reps at the end. Right. Yeah, because no. they're, they're so far behind. You got to um, have perfect form. Yeah. Like you, what you do when you, the, the weaker arm is dictating how many you're going to do on the, the strong arm. It's where form even slightly starts to go. So you stop before that. Like you do not want to, you know, get like five perfect reps. And then you're like, oh, I can get six, but six is rolling the shoulder and rocking the elbow to get the six rep in. And then you go do six on the weaker, on the stronger arm that you could easily do six. And like, you don't want to do that because 
even if your your bicep starts to catch up, then you've created really bad patterns and habits on the on the right side where you'll have this kind of shoulder roll and rock every time you curl on the weaker side, like stay strict for We need to stop thinking of muscles in isolation. What you work is what you strengthen. Yep. So if your technique is off and you're working that off technique, that's how you get stronger. You get stronger with bad technique because you're going to hardwire bad technique. That's right. And then trying to reverse out of it can become very challenging. By the way, I remember God, one, of, one of the most insane things we ever saw on the podcast is when we released Map Symmetry. So, Map Symmetry is a program that's specifically designed to balance out right and left. And if you've been working out for a long time and you've never done an entire two or three month period of unilateral training, you probably have some imbalances. Okay. So, most people. But there was that one girl who was very highly trained, very fit. She did one of those scans where it could literally show how many pounds of lean body mass was in the right arm versus the left arm, the right, the right leg versus the left leg. And there was a small difference, which most people will have. She followed map symmetry and they came out perfectly balanced. So she built muscle on the weaker side and it caught up to the stronger side. It was like side. a DEXA scan or something. I think like it was a DEXA yeah, scan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it came back that. totally balanced, which is really cool because if you're advanced, super you, validated. You may think to yourself how hard it is to build muscle. An easy hack to build muscle when you're advanced is to find these weaknesses because she gained, I don't remember what it was, like a quarter pound or half a pound of lean body mass on her own right leg versus left leg or whatever. She built muscle yeah. it, and it went exactly where it and needed to. And balanced her out. So that had she not done that, her bilateral stuff. Exactly. Had yeah. she not done that, it would have never happened. Yeah. Next question is from Travis Goddard, 82. Should you not increase the weight when performing a barbell back squat until you can go below 90 degrees? Mm. You know, in a perfect world, I would try to work on mobility and form and depth before adding weight because adding range of motion is also adding is also progressively overloading. So people don't realize this, but if you go 90 degrees with 100 pounds and then through mobility and technique, you're able to go below 90 degrees, you've increased the, you've progressively overloaded yourself. It's like adding weight to the bar because you've lengthened the range of motion. So this, and the reason why I'm saying that is because people often, often think, They'd rather add weight than add range of motion. Yeah. But when it comes to building muscle and you know functional, whatever, it's it's they both build muscle. One is actually more functional than the other, which is increasing range of motion. So in a perfect world, I'm going to see if I can get the person to go deeper than 90 degrees. Now, when that doesn't play out is when I get those occasional, and I'd say probably 10, 15% of my clients, it wasn't worth trying to get them to go up below 90 degrees because it was just so much and so many things we had to work on. And it's just... At that point, it was like, let's just get you stronger, and this is working, yeah. and we'll try some other exercises on top of yeah, it. Yeah, or you're yeah, you, you're already getting stronger. I mean, there's it really depends on your goal in terms of like 100%. if it's a, an overall health desire or if it's like I want to get strong at this lift and I want to, you know, if I'm I have desires to like ego specific kind of desires, or I want to get to a certain amount of weight on my back for my squat, and I want to put up as, this much weight for bench. And you know, if they're they're somewhat competitive with themselves, like ninety degrees is pretty. That's a pretty reasonable squat for you to to achieve uh, and get like and load up substantially. So, uh, it the only time I kind of steer in that direction is too if there's. There's issues with um, like my my glutes aren't really firing. I'm not feeling a connection there. I'm very quad dominant. Whatever. Like you know, I might want to address that and, and be like, well, depth is going to play a factor into that. But so. your glutes always fire, so. But yeah, so that's usually I mean, not a problem for me. You you hit it on the head. It 100 percent has to do with your goals. Um, and I like this question because it just it highlights the nuances of training somebody is. If I, had I been sitting down with Travis and uh, asking him questions on his personal goals, my answer could be th like three different answers on yeah. like how I, I'm going to coach him on this. An example of that is myself. Uh, when I was competing to be a bodybuilder, I was very aware of my lack of range of motion in my squat. I could only get down to about 90 degrees. But I had a very specific goal to build as much muscle on my legs yeah, and you're present to pack it on. Yeah, present at an best. extreme level. Yeah. And and I could care less that I could I wasn't getting three or six inches deeper. Yeah. As soon as I was done competing, and that was no longer the main focus for me, and I'm thinking now I'm going to be a father in the future. I'm getting older. I want I care more about health and joint health and mobility and flexibility. Like that then that became the pursuit. Then I sacrificed adding weight to the bar to continue to increase range of motion. So 
it really depends on the person's goal and what they are stressing to me is the most important thing at that point in their life, how I'm going to coach them. I'm going to educate them no matter what and say like, okay, we can build the most massive quads and just be focused on that and not really worry about your, and, and sacrifice some mobility right now. Know that if this was the long play, I'd want to do that first and do that. But at the end of the day, you hire me, you tell me what we're going to do. This yeah. is what we're going to do right now. now. But yeah. again, generally speaking, I would it would probably be ideal to try and go a little below 90 degrees. Overall, you'll feel better. You'll probably build muscle. Yeah. Overall, just with all things being considered, um, for most people, I would say that would be where I would focus for sure. Next question is from CMOS23. If all of you had to do a different podcast, but it couldn't be fitness related, what would you talk about? Mm. Politics, movies, and... No, oh, not movies for movies? Justin. Yeah. You don't think so? Conspiracies. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of calling it mind fuck. <laughs> like, you already yeah. thought about this? I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously. He's like, I'm going to do my spin like, We're going to solve the world's problems like by exposing everything. I feel like I'd be your occasional co-host on that show. I think like, so. Like every once in a while I'd get on and I'll just, uh, yeah, talk about weird stuff. Put you on Zoom and we'd, we'd riff it out. Yeah. You would be politics, wouldn't you? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. I kind of like the direction that Justin is going with conspiracy. It'd be more fun because I think yeah. I'd, 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 I'd be so toxic talking about politics. You know, I think after five episodes, I little, guess you could politics get, would go in. With I was that, gonna say right? you could yeah. probably still get some of your politics. Yeah, so into, if we were if we were on a show together, yeah. I would mix that in with the conspiracies, and you would have the pure conspiracy. See, what's so great about that is it's like it gets it gives you sci fi and politics, yeah. and like like all of those factors. That's all true. I don't know. I think you would like. I think what you would enjoy the most about the politics is actually the intellectual banter with you, your guest or the people you're challenging because you like you thrive in that. I you do, but it starts to get toxic, man. Oh, mm. I, I just identify. That it just does, you know. I, I it's, it's, I, I would also have to think about what I want to keep doing that. Well, imagine like doing nothing but talking about conspiracy theories. You'd be fucking tinfoil <laughs> hat out, dude, like crazy. You, you, know you wouldn't trust anybody if that's all you fucking <laughs> talked about and you studied and you read. Like, could you imagine? I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of cool. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'd have cool. like multiple personality disorder or something. Like, I'd have some kind of psychological. You'd like, have to create a new personality yeah. just to deal with it all. You would business for sure. That's easy. Probably yeah. something in that vein. I think yeah. so. Yeah, finance, finance or, yeah, yeah, investments, yeah. or something, yeah, like something that. along those lines. I think I would in, in, enjoy to do that. What about you, Doug? What would you do? That's a tricky one because I have a lot of interests, but I don't think I can go very deep on any of them. You know what I mean? That's a podcaster. <laughs> most, most podcasts, it's just surface. I just talk about all types of things. Well, I mean, assume, it's the armchair, that, whatever. That would cause you to. I mean, there's a reason why I don't have a business podcast because for the same reason, like I don't. I would want to be even more versed in that in that world. So, but that would cause me to go deeper in that world. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I have an interest in business as well, especially like startup type business yeah. uh, conversations. Uh, photography would be something I would be interested in. Since I do enjoy that, um, God, imagine how boring that would be. I know. It's like, <laughs> you had to listen to all right, podcast. let's talk about apertures. <laughs> hey, you're, hey you're, you're, here, you're listening to someone talk about pictures. Yeah, it's beautiful. You should yeah, see yeah. it. I know you can't see it right now, but it's really. No, I'd be more like the technical aspect of photography, yeah. that type of thing. But you know, again, not very exciting. Yeah, Andrew, if you build a podcast, what are you building? I would do the production. Oh, a, a podcast around production. No, no, I'm saying I would do the production. Oh, you're like, I would, oh, you, I would do the, the, production the producer. For I don't want to be on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I was talking to, uh, who was that? I was teasing my cousin. I'm on this group thread with my cousins, and I check in every once in a while. And basically, I do. I go in there, I break their balls. That's, that's, my, that's my job. So I go in there, and I remember what they were doing. They, they were all talking crap about uh, each other's jobs and whatever. And this is, this is, again, we just break each other's balls. So I got on there and I'm like, man, I have, I literally have the perfect like job ever. And like, what do you mean? I said, I get to talk about what I love to talk about, which mm -hmm. is fitness and bullshit. So yeah. really, if you mix that all in, it's great. I said, I get free supplements, which had you asked me at the age of, I don't know, between the ages of 14 to now, what would be what an awesome perk? Yeah. Free supplements. I even get testosterone hooked up because I'm on TRT and they send it to me which and I get access to peptides. Are you kidding me? And you leave work at one? And I get to leave work <laughs> and hang out with my, <laughs> my family and my kids. Yeah. Keep, keep awesome. keep How could you not add that in there? You're going to add that in there. That's a definite <laughs> That's part, also a nice you know? Now you drive a minivan? Yeah. It's, I don't even, yeah the yeah, minivan things are, things is are in looking future, up. I feel like. I feel like you're going to be the one who breaks and does the minivan first. We got the Suburban. That's got a lot of seats. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you don't you don't you don't complain about the gas on that's that. That's the hack, you know, sure to stay a little bit cool. Yeah, is what that's exactly what I would do. Yeah, is, is if I had this many suburban, kids, suburban would be yeah. would be the move. What if I got like I mean, an X is a bus? I mean, where are you? What if go I got like here? an A team minivan? 
You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> Is that I okay? saw one of those the other day. Did you? Yeah, yeah. It was like, uh, so it's like the panel van, and it has like a little like. Why did the Why did it have that, that tall window? Yeah, no, no the, the wing. The, yeah, the spoiler wing thing on top of a van, <laughs> bro. There was a second. It's not there. aerodynamic. There was a second there. That's like a toaster. Yeah. There was a second there where people were making minivans like into like like they look like fast cars or something. Yeah. Remember that? Oh yeah, they were trying to like trick them out all crazy. Yeah, it's like dude, well, you know what, you're doing. You know what that is just... today is the uh, those like the Mercedes ones now that everybody oh, sprinter vans. Yeah, right. sprinter vans. Oh, that's like the those new. Are sick. That is the thing now yeah. is to take those and customize. There's so a there's, big business in customizing. There's only those. so there's only two kinds of vans that I would drive. One of them would be the A team looking type one. Yeah. The other one, and Justin will appreciate this, is I'd get a minivan armored. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Gatling gun on top. Yeah. 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 You're like, getting me, dude. Yeah, it'd be popular with the kids, and I drop the kids off with yeah. the teachers. <laughs> hey, teachers. Yeah. Hurry, no. go. I would have a van, and then I'd have, you ever see those, like, those vans that people have? They're like a, like a wizard yeah. painting oh, on the yeah. side, yes, like, like a dragon yeah, yeah, or some yeah. weird thing. Oh, you're just it. shooting yeah, yeah. lightning bolts. Tell yeah. me that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. You guys went on a ride. I would totally yeah, be yeah. about that. You know what? I, you always hear people that have them and drive them that like you, when they hear us talk shit or whatever, they're like, yeah, well, that's how I thought too. And then I drove one. That's what everyone always says. Like, and then you drive one and you're like, oh man, this so comfortable. Yeah, my life. Yeah, yeah, that's I, what it, I grew up in one, so I know what it's like to, and I What'd you guys have? We had a minivan. No, what, no, what was it? Dodge Caravan. Oh, you had a Caravan. Dude, we had we an Aerostar. Aerostar. Oh, you had one too? I did, Dude, yeah. what a terrible car. The one we had was Stick Shift. My it's dad bought a Stick Shift yes. Aero, uh, 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 Aerostar. Same. Oh, my. That's you great. Mm -hmm. Aerostar is further back, right? That's even before the Dodge Caravan, isn't it? No, I think Dodge is first. Late 80s. Oh, really? I think the first minivan Mighty. was Dodge. I think. Oh, I don't know. I didn't I know think. that. I didn't know. Bro, the stick on it was so long. It's a big-ass <laughs> minivan. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I remember that thing. <laughs> it was what terrible. A, what a piece. Anyway, look, if you love the show, and I know you do because you're still here, go to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free fitness guides. we got a lot of them, and they're all free. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. I'm on Instagram at mindpumpdestefano, and Adam is on Instagram at mindpumpadam.